we want to we want to run out of it we want we can't handle the quietness but it's in his quietness and in the stillness of the lord that you can hear him speak to your heart it's in the quietness that the holy spirit can come and do an amazing work it's in those moments where you just be still and you're not talking and you're just letting god just whatever he wants to do whether he wants to sing over you whether he wants to bless you whether he wants to uh, just speak to you, whether it's in a small whisper, whether he just wants you to be still. You ever have a friend that you can just sit and you don't even have to talk, just be in their presence and just relax. Those are some of the most beautiful friendships, moments, relationships that you can have with someone is when you're just sitting in their presence and you're not even talking. You don't have to perform. You don't have to come up with a conversation. You can just be. Have you guys experienced that before? It's beautiful when you experience that with Jesus. And uh, I just felt in that moment he just wanted to speak, and he did. Cast your cares upon Jesus, for he cares for you. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles tonight. I don't think I'm, I'm not going to be long. I just, I feel like I just got a couple of things. I don't know about you guys, but I'm still, I'm still eating off a of Sunday. I don't know if you guys were here Sunday. I'm still eating off of what was spoken Sunday. The Lord is still dealing with me on that. I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't leave. I mean, everybody was coming up to me on the piano. I'm, it's hard when you're up sta- on the stage and you're crying and snot, and, and I'm, like, putting my hair down, and I'm like, don't look at me. Don't even come up here. But for some reason, everybody was asking me every single question that day, and I'm up there just, like, trying not to talk to people, trying not to be rude, but... God was dealing with me, and he was just speaking to me. And, uh, you know, I I was saying to Ange, I said, Ange, I don't even know if I need to preach. I said, I feel like we just need to recap what you preached on. And she was uh, laughing at me. I said, I'm serious. God is still dealing with me when she was talking about getting your own oil. And I was even talking to Rob and them. She was talking about the ten virgins, those that weren't here on Sunday. She was talking about the ten virgins. but And I, they were talking about being deceived in another Jesus. And I was saying to Rob and them at the table, I said, you know what? I think the other Jesus is going to be the deception of our own hearts, to be deceived that we've never lost him, to be deceived that we're right with him and we're not. I said, that's the Jesus that we're going to be say, uh, deceived by. And Robert said, the Jesus that we form ourselves. Because in Revelation, it was talking about that he said, he said, you, you had your good works. You had all these good things, he said. And he was telling them these were good things that they had. And, it, and he even said that you were able to discern true, truth and false teachings. And I feel like we, I mean, if someone came in here and said that they were Jesus, walked through the day, it was like, I'm Jesus, follow me. I don't think any of us would be deceived by that. Really, I don't. We have way too much knowledge. We've been taught way too much stuff. You guys understand a lot of the scriptures more than a lot of other different churches. But I think the deception would be in all of our hearts, and if we don't check our hearts and keep ourselves at the foot of the cross, is to be deceived that we haven't left our first love because we have the works, because we have the knowledge, because we have the understanding. That's going to be the deception that we never lost them. Because that's what happened. They said, he said, you did all these things. He said, but you lost your first love. And to be deceived because we do all these things and whatever it is, but we lost him, that's going to be the thing. And I heard someone speaking the other day. They were saying, this is the state of the church. Mary and Joseph was with Jesus And they were traveling to the temple, and they did their religious acts, and they left. And they didn't even realize they were traveling a whole day's worth until they realized they left Jesus at the temple. And they realized they left him, and the guy was saying, that's the state of the church. He said, we're doing all these religious activities, and we're doing all these things for Christ, but we left Jesus a whole day journey behind. And then when they got to Jesus, they said to Jesus, what are you doing? He said, I'm about my father's business stating that they were not about the father's business, but they thought they were doing what God called them to do, but they left their own son. They left Jesus behind. How many times I feel like even myself, I get caught up in the things and doing and doing, and the Lord's standing at the door, and he's like, Naya, can I come in? You're doing all these things, and I'm not even here with you. I didn't even ask you to do it. I didn't even ask you to do these things, but you're doing it. And we get so busy in the rat race of life, 
and we, we lose him. Let's turn in the book, in our books, the Bible today. We're going to be turning to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm actually going to get, um, let's see. I need some. But John, I'm going to get you to read for us tonight. Can you do that, brother? Acts chapter, I'm going to give you a mic so that way they could hear on the recording just because we're recording. Thank you. All right, yeah, we're going to start in the book of Acts, chapter 5, starting verse 1. Go ahead and read to uh, verse 11. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And I read that story, I don't know about for you, it, it is such a, a check in my heart. It's like, man, what, what really happened, Lord? What really took place here? They, they had some land, and they sold the land, and then they decided to take the money that they said to Peter. They said, all the money we got for the land, here it is. And the Lord gave Peter discernment right then and there. He gave Peter discernment, and Peter said to him, he said, Ananias, right here. Well, actually, let's look at verse 2, and it says, And kept part of the price, his wife also being privy. That word privy mean, meaning that she shared in the knowledge of it. She knew what her husband was doing. Uh, he said to her, he said, look, I'm going to sell this land, and I'm going to tell the church this is all we got for it, but I'm going to keep a cut for ourselves. But I'm going to tell Peter, this is all we sold for the land, and we're going, to, we're going to go. And she was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Let's keep a little something for ourselves. But let's say we did it all so we can look a certain way. And she agreed. She was privy to it. She understood what was going on, and she went along with it. And then right away, he said, but Peter said to Ananias, he said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? He didn't say, why did, the, why did Satan fill your heart to lie to me? He said, but to the Holy Spirit. And when I started to, to read that and think about it, I was asking myself, Lord, you know, a lot of times I find in my life, we will lie to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm not going to do this anymore in your name. Lord, I'm going to uh, not go to that place anymore. Lord, I'm not knowing in our hearts that when that moment arrives, we, we're going to go back to that thing, the very thing that might be the idol in our lives. So even though we said to the Lord, I'm not going to do this anymore, but yet we will say it maybe for a moment to feel a certain uh, justification in that moment 
or maybe a moment of sorrow comes upon us, but then we know deep down in our hearts, okay, it's like, Lord, I'm not going to do this. I got to get right because church is on Sunday, and I want to feel free to worship on Sunday. Uh, I don't know about you. I'm just putting myself out there. I've been in situations in my life and relationships in my life and times and seasons of my life where I knew I shouldn't have been, but I would say to the Lord, okay, listen, uh, Friday I might have messed up, but Sunday's coming. So, hey, we, I can't see you. I'm going a different way. I'm not going to uh, be in this relationship here with you anymore. And then when Sunday comes, because then I can say, Lord, I'm clean and I'm right before you and I'm going a different way. But in my heart... I knew I was going to pick up the phone come Monday when I got lonely. I knew in my heart that I was going to go to whatever that thing that I needed to go to. And then maybe by Tuesday, because church is Wednesday, I'll be like, oh, we got to stop doing what we're doing. And maybe I'm just preaching to myself. But I'm telling you, there's been moments in my life that I've lied to the Holy Spirit. And I said I wasn't going to do this or that in my own strength. But I just seen it as just, you know, just telling a, a little, I was telling the truth, but in my heart, I knew I wasn't done with that relationship. I knew that thing was not dead to me. And every single time I would lie, I would take it lightly, but I was lying to the Holy Spirit. But he's so gentle, he's so compassionate, he's so merciful. But at this time... When Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, Peter said, you lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept back part of the price of the land. And to me, that was, I lied and said I wasn't going to do a certain thing, but I kept back part of my heart still to be attached to whatever that love was. I kept back part of me still saying this is still going to be for that thing even though I was trying to present myself as a living sacrifice, as a whole sacrifice. And I'm like, God, I give you everything. But yet, even as I was saying the words off my lips, my heart was still set apart for another. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is something that is so necessary that we examine our hearts. You kept part of the price of the land. Look at verse 4. He said, while it remained, he said, was it not yours? And after it was sold, was it not yours to own? Oh, sorry. Was it not in your own power? You know, the, the sin here and, and Ananias and Sapphira's situation, the sin was not that he kept back part of it, but it was that he pretended to have given all. That was, the, that was the thing. It wasn't that he kept back part of his land, because first of all, the Lord didn't even tell him. I, don't, I, I read it. I didn't see that God told the man to sell his land and to give all his goods. That wasn't something that the Lord told him to do. That was something that he thought in his head. He heard people doing it, and he was like, I'm going to do it too. But the sin wasn't that he kept back, but it was that he pretended to give everything to God. That is the problem. When we pretend that our life is his and we say it with the words of our mouth, but we don't live it with the heart and the state of our hearts. And that's what was happening here. And not only that, it said, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias heard these words, fell down, and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all of them who heard these things. And then the young men rose up and they carried him out. Ananias' name, actually, when I look it up, this is uh, incredible. I never knew what this man's name meant. It says, uh, in Hebrew, it says, God was gracious. In Greek, it says that the gift of, it was the gift of the Lord. And then also they put it together. They say Jehovah has gracious, has gracious given. Jehovah has graciously given. So God was gracious. And then it also means the gift of the Lord. And Jehovah has graciously given. And when you look up that name Jehovah, 
And I thought it was incredible when Lillian, when she said, I am, she didn't know what I was talking about. But Jehovah, when you look it up, it means I am. It's first brought about uh, when Moses went before the burning bush and he went before and the Lord spoke to him. He was like, who are you? He said, I am that I am. I am that I am. And he said, take off your shoes for this is holy ground. Take off your sandals for this is holy ground. And then I started looking up, but also it says, um, it says, Jehovah, I am that I am the one who is. The one who is. Let me look up this. Uh, I took a picture of some names of Jehovah. So if you put the one who is before his name, it would say, it would say the one who is gracious and giving. And so many times, and then also it says, uh, if you look at the word Jehovah Shama, it says the Lord is there. It says, uh, if you look up Jehovah Nisi, it says the Lord our banner. Jehovah Mishkanesh, it says the Lord our sanctification. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Jehovah Bor, the Lord creator. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our shepherd. We sung that in the song tonight. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And in his name, it was saying, Jehovah is gracious in giving. The one who gives graciously. That was this man's name. That was literally what God wanted to produce in this man's life, the one who gives graciously. I think what he was trying to say in terms was that he was going to be a man that knew that everything that was given unto him was from the Lord. And I think when we live in that mindset that if we know everything that God has given us, everything that we have is God and it's only from Jehovah, the one who graciously gives, then we are going to be men and women that graciously, graciously gives because we know everything that we have doesn't belong to us. Everything that we've received is from God. And I think when we begin to live in that mindset, we will be people that are givers. We will be men and women that give not only in our finances, but also in our lives. Because we would know that every, even our breath, even the breath that we breathe is given from God. We sing that song. Is, what's that song? It says, uh, it's your breath in our lungs, right? It's your breath in our lungs, and we pour out our praise, and we sing it. But do we really live like every breath that we breathe? We wake up in the morning and say, God, uh, this is the day you have given me. I will rejoice. God, the breath that I'm breathing, let me live to glorify you in everything I say and do. And I'm speaking to myself tonight. But I believe if we walked in that mindset, knowing that he is Jehovah, the one who graciously gives, we would walk in a spirit of giving. And he want it to fulfill a look of a giver. And I think if we know that it's from God, then we would know that we can only do it by the grace of God. And he was trying to do it in his own works and, and pretend and, and make a lie and appear that he was giving all, but he wasn't giving all. Because we can't give all in our own strength. We cannot be 100% in our own strength. We need the grace of God. And so this man did not get to live up to his name. He only lived as a, it was just a pretend. It was a facade. It was fake. It was a false pretense, a false being, a false state of being. It was a lie. He forgot that God was the one that gave him everything. And I think in our lives, we forget it. I forget it. I go about my day, my job, my busyness, busyness, and I forget that God is the one that has given me everything. And not only that, he caused his wife to come in agreements with him. I'm not married, but I mean, there's married people in here, so I'm going to talk to the married people for a little bit. And if you're not married, maybe one day you will be. But even just with Jesus or your kids or whatever it may be, people in your life. Him being the head of the house. In that moment, he could have made a decision to say, baby, we got all this money. I know it's a lot of money. And I know we can actually do well with it. Let's keep some of it and then, 
and be honest about what we're going to give to the church. Or he could have said, I'm going to trust you, God. And he could have said to his wife, I'm, hey, let's give it all to Jesus and we're going to trust the Lord to give us a hundredfold. We're going to give it all to the Lord. But instead he came with another plot, another decision, and she went alongside of it. And she agreed to it. You know, a lot of times her name was um, Sephora. Wait, no, what is it? Uh, let me say this right. Sapphira. And when you look that up, actually, it's a gem. It's like a, they say it's like a blue, beautiful gem. It's a, a stone that's beautiful. And uh, my mom, <laughs> growing up when I was a girl, I used to be like, I'm going to just put myself out there. I, used to, I, w I didn't think I was, I was very much a tomboy. I'm still kind of very much like, I, I flip houses for a living. So, I mean, I was dating a guy one time, and he was holding my hand, and he literally said my hands were rougher than his. And I was just like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, but, like, he didn't like it. And I was like, dude, I work hard for my money. Like, what do you want me to do? I work hard. But he was like, your hands are so rough because I get cuts all over my hands and whatever. But growing up, I was such a tomboy, and I liked working with my dad and doing all these things, and I would tell my mom and be like, all the other girls are so, like, ditzy, and they all play dumb, and I, would like, and I would be like, I don't know how to play dumb. I said, I don't, and I remember her one time, I don't know how to laugh at a guy's joke if I don't think it's funny. I said, all my friends, I said, this boy was telling a joke, and they're all laughing, and I know it wasn't funny. I said, but they were laughing, and I come to her crying, like, I don't know how to be this ditzy-like thing. And she's like, nah, you don't have to do that. That's not what God, God's calling you to do. You don't have to be fake. But she would always say, beauty is as beauty does. And she would tell me that growing up. She said, you can be as beautiful as ever, but you can be as mean as a junkyard dog. What is that going to do for you? And she would tell me this growing up, talking about you can be beautiful, but you need to be beautiful in your heart. And she would speak that over me growing up. But this woman, she was supposed to represent something beautiful. Uh, she was supposed to be, her name was literally like a, it was a stone. It was a beautiful gem. And I started to think of Sephora. Anybody, you know that store? Am I saying that right? Where you go get your makeup? Am I saying that right, Sephora? So the girls would know, the younger girls. F Sephora, there it is, Sephora. And when I looked up, Erin knows uh, that's because of uh, Shari. Uh, Shari, yeah. <laughs> Shari be taking them to the store, right? But look, uh, Sephora, when I looked up that name, uh, I was actually surprised. It meant like a bird, but it also came from, it was the Greek, and it also came from uh, Zipporah in the Bible. Anybody know who Zipporah is? He was Moses' wife. And actually, her name means beautiful. Beautiful. And, uh, I, it may, and then I looked it up, and the only time they really talk about her in the book, um, Zipporah talks about her being beautiful, but it talks about her being Moses' wife. And it's actually, if we can turn to, is Exodus chapter 4. Uh, verses 25. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 25. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, there it is. Okay, and it says, and so, uh, Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at, the, at his feet and said, surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Next verse. So he let him go, and then she said, a bloody husband art thou because of the circumcision. So what am, why, why am I bringing that up? Because I'm talking about beauty as a woman. I'm talking about as, as beauty or even a man. Um, and her name meant beautiful. But in this story, Moses married her, and she was actually of, a, of, of another um, a foreign. She wasn't an Israelite. She didn't know the ways of the Lord, but the Israelites, they were circumcised their kids at birth and everyone was circumcised and that's how it was. But then he married a foreign woman named Sephora who was beautiful. And because she was beautiful and he was his wife and she did not know the ways of the Lord, he actually never circumcised his kids. And because of that, at the time, the Lord was speaking to Moses and telling Moses, hey, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. I'm going to send you back to Egypt, and you're going to go, and you're going to set my people free. You're going to declare to Pharaoh, set my people free. And if they, he said they're not going to actually listen at first, but then he said at the very end when you take their firstborn, that's when you'll be let go. But the Lord visited him in a tent, and he was telling him this, but the Lord also was showing Moses that if I'm going to send you out to be a judger, 
of the world, to be a judger of Pharaoh, to, to speak truth, to go ahead and proclaim what I'm saying. He said, but your household is unclean. And so God was letting Moses, I can't be in the presence in your house that is unclean. And also I can't let you be my servant if your house isn't in order. And he was saying to Moses, he said, your house isn't in order. I want to send you out to set my people free. I want to send you out to declare, let my people go. But in your house, there's bondage. In your house, there's things that you are not keeping right. In your house is unclean. Is unclean. But the reason why he chose not to circumcise his son was because his wife did not agree with it. And he wanted to keep his peace. He was saying a happy wife, a happy life but not knowing that it's better to be in disagreement with your wife than to be standing in disagreement with God. And he did not want to take that chance because why? His wife was beautiful. And so she was running the house. And the Lord was showing up in his tent. And the Lord showed up in Moses' tent. And he realized there's an uncleanness in his tent. And he went to go kill the son. He grabbed a hold of Moses' son and was going to kill his son. And, and guess what? Zipporah knew exactly why he was going to kill the son. Because I'm pretty sure this conversation was going on a lot of times. You know, when you have disagreement in marriage or any relationship that you're in, you don't have that disagreement just one time, but it's a constant thing. Before you marry someone, the very thing that you argue with, before you marry, it's still going to be there. After you say, I do, you're still going to argue. And so I'm pretty sure they were arguing about this thing often. Because for her to know exactly why the Lord was going to kill him, that means she knew in her heart. She was standing in the presence of God. God was in her house. And a lot of times when we're trying to live for Jesus in our house, it confronts the very thing that is not of God. As we try to live for the Lord, the very thing that we have in our home that is not of God is constantly uh, shining as light upon it. Because when light is in the room, darkness has to flee. So there's a constant battle going on. And there was a constant battle going on in their marriage. And she knew right away and she cut off the foreskin. She cut off and she circumcised her son and she threw it at him and said, you're my bloody husband. But... I wanted to bring that story up because there was a difference. Well, actually, they both had the wrong response. Both wives were not able to submit to their husbands. Uh, well, the one was submitting in wickedness, but Moses was trying to live righteous, and the one wife was fighting against it. So I encourage you tonight, don't be that wife. I encourage you tonight, even in your own relationship with the Lord, if you're not married, don't be that woman, that Jezebel spirit. She was beautiful in name, but not beautiful in character. And as, you, as we continue to read, back to Acts chapter 5, look at verse 7. And it came about three hours. I'm just going to paraphrase. The wife shows up now. Well, actually, let's back up. It said in verse 5, Ananias heard these words and fell down. And gave up the ghosts, and great fear came on them all who heard these things. My question was this, and my own self, when she showed up, why weren't the people whispering saying, hey, look, your husband just got, your husband just gave up the ghost. He's dead. We put him in the ground. You better tell the truth. Why wasn't anybody telling her that? Why I know I know if somebody came in the house of God and said something to Pastor Matt and he said and they dropped dead and I knew the wife was gonna come in, I would be like, You better get it right. Don't go up there telling a lie. You're gonna be dead on the ground. Sister, run. Get right with Jesus, right? I would be telling her. And then not only that, it said they heard it and fear spread throughout the land. Like fear, so that means it was traveling. That means, come on, if someone fell dead on the ground right here, right now, and people were walking in, we would be telling them at the door, hey, so-and-so just dead. We just had to put him in a hole. We would be telling them, right? I bet you people were whispering. I know people were hearing because fear started to spread amongst the people. But why didn't she hear? Her hearing was already going to the things of God. She couldn't even hear clearly anymore. 
I know for a, a shadow of a doubt, she was so focused on what she was about to spend that money on and what she was about to do with what she kept back from the Lord. It was robbing her of her hearing to actually hear what the spirit of the Lord was saying to her. And how many times do we come in the house of God and we've only given 25% or 50% and we come in and we don't hear the things of God because he's speaking to us and we walk out the door the same way we came in. She wasn't hearing because she turned off her ears to the things of God. It was already gone. It was already gone. The Lord was speaking fear the Lord was already bringing conviction to others hearts around them but she was missing it she was already caught up in her own desires there was already there was no more yielding to the things of God so she came in and she did the same scenario Peter said hey did you give all the money? I don't even know if I, if I was Peter, I would have tried to have compassion and been like, sister, I know you didn't give all the money. Don't lie. Like, I would have been like pleading with her, please don't tell me a lie. I don't want to see you dead too. But he said, hey, did you give, is this all the money from your land? And she said, yeah. And sure enough, this is what Peter said to her. Peter said unto her, how is it that you have agreed together to attempt to tempt the holy to tempt the spirit of the lord and behold the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost and the young men came in found her dead and carried her forth buried her by her husband and a great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Do not let it go in one ear and out the other. John, if you can go ahead and turn to uh, chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4, starting in verse 31. I mean, starting in verse 32. If you can read that to 37, please. And the multitude, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and bought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow, what a difference. What a difference. It's like night and day. This man, I'm going to say Joseph, I don't think that's how you really pronounce it, but um, his name, and when you look up his name, uh, it's actually incredible. When I looked up his name, I was really surprised. Hang in there with me. We're almost going to wrap it up here. His name actually meant increase. Also to exalt. So increase means to bring or make greater in size or amount. And then exalt means to place or to be high or powerful in level or high in height and high regards. And then also it said Barabbas was a name that they gave him. This name Barabbas was actually the name that the people gave him. Listen, look in here what Barabbas says. It says the son of consolation or comfort. All right, and this was a name that the men has given him. And I started to think to myself, what, what does that speak of his character? When someone, when the people in the church are whispering 
a name that is not yours, and they're saying, man, that's the daughter of constellation. That's the son. That's the son. Uh, uh, that's the son of the comforter right there. He's a comforter. She's a comforter. She's an, she's an encourager. He's an encourager. I mean, that's something. I don't know about you, but if I was going around here in, that, in the church, they were saying, man, that's the daughter of Zion or something. I don't know. Y'all were coming up with some name for me. I'll be like, whoa, like that speaks high of someone's character. Is it one thing to call yourself something, but when the body of Christ is calling you something else, that means they see Jesus in you. When is it, isn't it a blessing when someone says they see Jesus in you? Isn't that like one of the greatest compliments? To be like, man, you're a daughter of, like, woo. Like, that's a blessing. He didn't name himself this. This was the names that the brothers of the Lord gave him. That's a high compliment. That is incredible to say, man, that's a faithful brother. That's a faithful sister. That's a prayer warrior right there. That's a blessing. But then when you start to, to put it together, increase and exalt the son of consolation or comfort. And I say this, you know, when we begin to yield ourselves to God, when we begin to yield our bodies and our members to the things of God, there will be an increase in our life and there will be an exaltation and not even of ourself, but it will be an increase of Jesus. I'm not even talking about things. That's going to come. Those things are going to come, but to have an increase of Jesus, you are rich and abundant, and you have everything you need, like we were singing today. He's our shepherd. He's our God. He's our keeper. He has everything we need. To have an increase of Jesus, wow, that's what I want, an increase of Jesus in my life. And when there's an increase of Christ, then there's also an exaltation of Jesus. Jesus will be exalted, and the word of God says, when you exalt Jesus, all men will be drawn unto me. And when we allow ourselves to yield to God and an increase happens of Jesus, then he is exalted, and then men will be drawn unto him. That's what we want. That's what I want. That should be what the church of God wants tonight, that Christ will be lifted up, not men. And all those that are lost and dying, our loved ones, our family members, will be drawn unto him. And this man had an understanding of it. There was an increase in his life. He was exalting Jesus because he was yielding himself to God, to God's will. Are we yielding ourselves to the Lord's will and to desire that he desires in our life. He yielded himself, and because he yielded himself, he became more like Jesus. He became a comforter. And when you look up that word comforter, it said to have compassion, to pity. The church, we need to have compassion on the lost, but we also need to have compassion for each other. So many times we're so uh, kind to those who are not saved, but to each other, we're not very nice. It's like we're brothers and sisters in real life, man. When I was growing up, we were mean to my, I was mean to my brothers and sisters. I don't know why. We're mean to our family members. Man, we used to scrap and fight all the time. And uh, I remember one time in my life, I, I was a fighter. I don't know. I had a problem. I was fighting all the time. And then when I got adopted, my dad was, like, teaching me that, you know, you need not to fight. You need not to be angry and, and use your hands and, and learn to, and to be a bigger person. He was teaching me how to be different because before you just said something to me and I just pop you. I was just angry. And I looked to fight. And I remember one time we were downstairs and my sister and we were fighting and I was, I was just done. And I remember I did something and I popped her ankle. I don't even know how that even happened. I think I tried to body slam her and it got stuck. And you just heard pop. And she fell on the ground and she was screaming in like excruciating pain. And I was like, oh. And I, at first I was just like, I'm going to get in trouble. Stop crying. Like, please, please, please don't. You guys ever used to fight your brothers and sisters? And then they would start crying. You'd be like, don't tell mom. Don't tell dad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In that moment, I was so sorry. I was like, please don't tell him. Please don't tell on me. But you could hear her screaming throughout the whole house. There was no way I was going to get away with this. And I was being so mean. But in that moment, I don't know, something hit me. I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or what. I seen her crying. And, I, and, I, and I, I, at first, I wanted to weep for myself because I knew I was going to be in trouble. But something switched over in me. And I started to weep for her that I hurt her. 
it was different. And that was like the last time that I ever got in a fight or anything like that. And it was like I was weeping over her because she was in pain. And I started to, to pity. And I was like, I'm sorry. Like, oh, my goodness. And the crazy thing is my dad comes downstairs and he knew it. He comes downstairs and he just looks at it. And he's like, help her up. Come on, we're going to the hospital. And he could just tell, we get in the hospital, she gets the little thing off her. And he's like, your discipline is you're going to be her servant until she's healed. And he got me a little bell. He got her a little bell. And if she needed anything, my sister started ringing that bell. And, I mean, she milked it, y'all. She loved it. She was using that bell for anything and everything. Like one time I remember she was ringing the bell. I was downstairs. My dad's like, Naya, calling me upstairs. And I'm like, he's like, you hear that bell? And I was like, oh, man, I'm tired of this bell. Go upstairs. And she dropped her pencil on the floor. And she was doing homework. And I was like, are you kidding me? And at that moment, I wanted to pop her. But I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, I picked up her pencil and I walked away. But I mean, she, she had that for probably like a whole month or something. She loved it. But what I was saying is we're so mean to our family sometimes, so mean. Uh, but my friends, I would never hurt my friends. At the time when I was a teenager, I loved my friends. I would defend my friends before I'd defend uh, my brothers or sisters, twist it. And so many times we are so harsh to the body of Christ. We lose compassion. I'm number one. I'm like, man, you, here we go again with sister so-and-so. Here she is again. Oh, my goodness. Here this brother is again. Oh, here we go. And we, we just lose compassion with one another. But this man was a man of consolation. Actually, when you looked it up, it meant, it meant like hard times, dealing with a loss or, a, you know, a great loss, actually, to comfort, to pity. And I believe that's something the Lord wants to increase in the body of Christ, that we would have compassion for one another, that we would be a, a comforter. You know, he said, he said that uh, he actually was leaving, and he said, I'm going to send another. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. He's going to be the comforter because they were, they were experiencing great loss. The Lord was leaving in reality check. He wasn't there, and earth is rough. And life is hard, y'all. Life is hard. We don't need to come in the house of God and get beat up. Life is hard enough. We don't need to, we don't need to be backstabbing each other. Life is hard enough with those that aren't our brothers and sisters. We need compassion. We need compassion. And also it said that this man in verse 36, it says, um, okay, it says, who the apostles, okay, they named him Barabbas, sorry, Barnabas, which is being um, interpreted as the son of the consolation and a Levite. When you look up Levite, they actually was from, the Levites were the worshipers. They were the priests in the Old Testament. Uh, this man was a worshiper, but not only uh, in word or song, but he was actually living it out in his life. He was actually living it out. No one told this man to go and, and sell whatever he did and to give everything to the apostles. No one told it, but the Holy Spirit did. When you have a relationship with God, God can begin to speak to you and tell you and lead you into, uh, to what you're supposed to do in your life. If you need guidance, if you lack counseling, then seek God. He will lead you. He will guide you. That song literally said, where you lead me, I will follow, right? Let him lead you. Let him guide you. And as you yield to God and let him lead you, he will give you an increase he will be exalted, and he will make you people of great comfort and grace to the lost and even the body of Christ. He will make you a true worshiper. He was a Levite. He was a true worshiper. That's my desire. I don't just want to be known for singing or whatever. I want my life to be a true worshiper to God. I want my character to line up to what God wants in my life. And the only way that happens is by his grace, but I have to yield to it. We have to yield to God, and we have to give him 100%. He wants to make us whole 100%. We cannot give only half of our hearts to him and keep the other half for, to whatever else that we love. He wants it all. He requires it all. He gave his life to have it all. 
He paid the price to have it all. I know if I went and I bought, uh, I don't know anything about cars, uh, Mercedes Benz or something, and I went and I went and they said, this is worth whatever. I don't know how much a Mercedes Benz is. Anybody knows? A couple thousand, a hundred thousand, huh? 200,000, I don't know. I'll, I'll go and I say, this is all my money. And they're like, okay, great. They take my money. I worked hard for it. They take my money and they cut my car in half and say, here you go, drive it. Be like, what? I paid all this money for this. And they're like, no, uh, we're actually going to, well, okay, we, we'll give it to you, but we're going to take all the wheels and we're going to take the seats out of it. What good is that? But a lot of times that's how we do it with God. He's like, I've given you my all. I've given you everything. And we're like, okay, God, but we're going to skim and pretend to give you our whole lives. Let's not be two-faced with God. He sees it all. He sees it all. Let's not pretend Ananias, uh, the, the team can come back up. Ananias and um, Sephora, they were pretending. Take off your mask tonight and just be honest with God because he sees it anyhow. Take it off. He knows. Take it off and say, God, this is me. This is who I am, and I'm giving you all of it. I'm giving you all. I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. I'm not going to pretend like I have it all together. I'm not going to pretend to get praises to men because who cares if you get all the praises of men, but yet you're dying spiritually. He actually died physically. Thank God the Lord ain't striking us dead now. Oh, my goodness. I would be in the ground. I would be in the ground. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your love and compassion. Let's stand tonight. Thank you, God, for your mercy. We don't have to pretend with him.